Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll start by saying I've been asked, if possible, to ask people to move forward, and I know that's hard to do, but I've asked. Um, welcome to the first in a series of events around the campus that is, are focusing on the theme, Mega Disasters, Science, Policy, and Human Behavior, sponsored by the Center for Advanced Study and the Charles R. Walgreen Endowment. The purpose of this initiative is to raise awareness of the challenges facing humanity and to discuss the fact that these are not strictly science or policy or human behavior issues, but rather are issues that span all of these areas and that require interactions across the interfaces. We have a number of lectures scheduled for this fall semester, and in the spring, Professor Robert McKim, the head of religious studies, and I will be offering a course under the same initiative on the theme of the science and ethics of sustainability. We had one event a few weeks ago, uh, co-sponsored with the Center for Global Studies, Dr. Susanna Heck talking about tropical rainforests in Bolivia and El Salvador. But Dr. Thomas Casadevall's visit and lectures are really the lead-off lectures in this mega disasters initiative. Dr. Casadevall became regional director of the US Geological Survey's 15 state central region, which is between the Mississippi and the Continental Divide and the borders in 2000 after serving both as the deputy director and the acting director of the U.S. Geological Survey. He studied volcanoes around the world and from 1978 to 1996 was a geologist with the USGS Volcano Hazards Program. And we both agreed tonight that we remembered exactly when we met, which was March 30th, 1980, in the context of the recently awakened Mount St. Helens. Uh, and I don't remember the hour, but it was probably something like midnight when our spontaneously scheduled airplanes got into Vancouver. Um, there were a number of us who went there who actually didn't know what state Mount St. Helens was in. And I'm assuming Tom wasn't one of them, but I was. Um, he was stationed at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, the Cascades Volcano Observatory, and now he's at the USGS in Denver, Colorado. From 1985 to 1988, he was the advisory volcanologist to the government of Indonesia. Um, Tom did his undergraduate work at Beloit College in Wisconsin and his master's in geology and then PhD in geochemistry at Penn State. His honors and awards include the Department of Interior's Superior Service Award in 1994 and Meritori Meritorious Service Award in 2000. Um, because of other Katrina activities that are going on on campus this week, Tom is not talking about Katrina, but he received the 2006 Service to America Citizens Medal as the leader of a team of USGS scientists in Louisiana using boats and geospatial technology for hurricane rescue in the aftermath of Katrina. Um, those of us who are topography challenged will really really object to the next sentence. He resides in Colorado where his CV says that he enjoys bicycling, skiing, being in the mountains for work and pleasure, and the music, cuisine, and cultures of Latin America. So it's those mountains we missed on. Um, tomorrow at 4 o'clock, Tom will be talking in Spurlock Museum about field perspectives on the impacts of the Sumatra earthquake and tsunami on the people's cultures, politics, and economics of Indonesia. Tonight, however, he's going to tell us about his experiences in a different part of the world discussing the challenge of cultural awareness and natural disasters in the 1994 Rwandan refugee crisis. Tom, welcome. Good evening. Thanks very much, Sue. Um, let me ask some audiovisual questions. Uh, is there a clicker, Liesl, that advances? Up and down on the keyboard. OK, great. And is there a possibility of lowering the lights a little bit or dimming the lights? Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I can't believe this is my first trip to Champaign-Urbana. Um, I actually began my college with my freshman year over at Illinois Wesleyan, uh, which is pretty close by. I hope some of you know where Illinois Wesleyan is. Um, and I went there for a year, and at the time, my family was living in South America. We were living in Argentina. And I was very interested in, in sort of social anthropology. And uh, I transferred my sophomore year to Beloit College, which has an excellent anthropology program. 
and uh, I completed an anthropology uh, major, and then I got interested in geology, and I stayed an extra semester to get uh, two majors there. And I would say most of my career with, uh, in, in, in the sciences, or most of my career as an adult, um, I've been in a position to combine sort of anthropology and anthropological thinking about issues with geologic uh, hazards and the whole, partic particularly volcano hazards. And as Sue said, we met on March 30th, uh, 1980. Um, when I was in Hawaii and I got a call from a friend saying there's a volcano near Vancouver, um, I said, boy, I've got to get up there. I said, uh, but I wonder why is the USGS going up to Canada to, to work on a volcano? And it wasn't until later that I realized that this volcano was actually near, near uh, Portland, Oregon. I'm sure you guys all knew that. Um, just a little bit at the start. Th this is really, this, this talk and the one I'm going to give tomorrow, they're really stories. Um, and they're not going to focus as much on the geology as they are on the relationship between the, the geological situation that produced hazardous conditions and the peoples that were involved with these. And uh, so I'm hoping there's some social anthropologists in the room. I'm hoping there's some geologists in the room. I'm hoping there's some of you have just come just to hear a story. And secondly, this story is about um, arguably one of the most horrific um, issues that humankind faced in the 20th century. And that was the Rwandan refugee crisis of, of 1994 and the situation that led up to that. And I'm not a political scientist and I'm not an expert in this area, but what I want to do is start off with a, a few definitions and talk to you about natural hazards and the definition of extreme low probability meteorological or geological phenomena that have the potential to cause disasters when humans are involved. If you get involved in disasters, and I'm guessing that some of you here have either worked part of your career in, in internationally or been involved in some aspect of, of hazard management, um, the, the typical hazard cycle, and I could have drawn this as a cycle, and a lot of this thinking, by the way, comes from the book by uh, Dennis Maletti, a uh, recently retired professor at the University of Colorado and the director of the Hazards Research Institute there. Um, Dennis has just written a wonderful book. It's about three years old now, and the name is escaping me. But um, this, is, this is pretty common uh, parlance when you talk about the disaster cycle. The, the concept of preparedness prior to disasters, response once the disaster hits, recovery following the disaster, and then mitigation. And while many of you probably didn't participate in the Rwandan crisis or what we'll talk about tomorrow, the Sumatran earthquake and Indian Ocean tsunami, we all lived to one extent or the other Hurricane Katrina just a year ago. We all read or heard about it in the news that it was coming. We saw the mayor of New Orleans uh, talking to the people of New Orleans in the 48, 72 hours beforehand as they prepared and including an evacuation. We saw the initial response and the, and the, and the piece that Sue mentioned uh, that the USGS is being recognized for this week in Washington, D.C. Is the, is the role the USGS played in that response, particularly in the search and rescue. And then the recovery, um, the, the post-disaster recovery phase, and that's really where New Orleans is today. And then the mitigation, the Army Corps of Engineers has already spent several billions of dollars trying to restore and fortify the levee system. More than 400 miles of levees in the New Orleans area are being, um, being readied or up upgraded. So this is the disaster cycle that we'll focus on a little bit. Preparedness, typically you'll hear things called vulnerability analysis or risk analysis, detection and warning, the detection of an active volcano or the detection of seismic activity along a fault in California, or the detection here of meteorological events like the tornadoes that struck this part of the country over the weekend. Um, a lot of planning goes into this, a lot of training and education all the way from K through 12 to the general public. In the response area, uh, once again, detection of the hazards um, as, the, as the events occurring, giving warnings in real time, 
Obviously, evacuation is, is pretty critical, and then emergency care, including medical care. In the recovery, restoration of the infrastructure, think the levees in, in, in New Orleans, repair, reconstruction, disaster relief. Have many of you volunteered to go down to the Gulf Coast and either to see or participate? Um, you know, I, I, I've made several trips down there. First of all, the USGS has, we have about 400 employees in Texas, East Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And uh, a number of our employees literally lost everything. We had no loss of life, but we had folks who lost their homes, their businesses, um, r r literally everything they had. And um, I, I try to recommend to people that if you, if you feel the urge to be involved, you know, make a trip down there um, and, and volunteer. There was a, a good piece on public radio this morning about uh, some students from Maryland who just spent a week down there and they, they talked about their experiences. But it's, uh, it's an important part of what's happening in this country now. And if you can get down there firsthand, I mean, we can get in the car tonight and we'll be there by noon tomorrow. And uh, you ought to go. Mitigation. Uh, we talked about the Corps of Engineers and what they're doing. This is, this is pretty common. If you look at Sumatra now, if you look at uh, the Indian Ocean area, uh, you'll see a lot of, of rebuilding going on and uh, infrastructure and particularly zoning trying to zone out areas that uh, could be impacted by future natural events that could produce disasters. Of course, economic incentives and building codes. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to show you a lot of, of text slides. This is, this is the story that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the refugee crisis in Goma Zaire. We've just, we're a little bit past the 11th anniversary now. But focusing on, on three elements, the ethnic differences and the civil unrest and then uh, the part that I was involved with had to do with the fact that when these refugees streamed out of Rwanda in July of 1994, they went to several areas. Some went to Burundi to the south, um, and the other major influx went up into eastern Zaire, which is now called Congo, our Democratic Republic of the Congo. And when they got to eastern Zaire, um, basically the only places were these 800 thousand refugees could locate were on vacant lands and the reason those lands were vacant is that they were fresh lava flows from two active volcanoes and uh, the civil side and the military side first of all the United States military we had a major military presence in the area we were providing what's called the lift capacity to get all the the supplies the relief supplies into uh, Zaire into Goma and uh, they were very concerned about the two active volcanoes. And then the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, was very interested because they were identifying where the camps would be, and they certainly didn't want to put people in an additional harm's way. And then we had the non-governmental organizations, the NGOs, like Oxfam, uh, Save the Children, Doctors Without Borders, etc. And uh, they were interested in understanding these hazards. So I went over in early August of 94, and uh, as part of a team that, uh, that worked, we had some Japanese scientists, some French scientists, some Italians, and then myself and a colleague from the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory went over. And uh, basically, we worked with the various agencies I've just described and, uh, to assess the volcanic hazards. And uh, that's the story that you're going to hear. This, of course, everybody know this flag? This is the flag of Rwanda. A little bit about the geography. Um, first of all, these key features here, this is Lake Kivu. Lake Kivu has a surface elevation of 1,600 meters, so it's a little over 4,000, uh, uh, over 5,000 feet, which is very significant because even though it's in a tropical equatorial belt where it gets hot or warm during the day, at night, uh, the temperatures drop down into the 50s, and it's, and it's, a, it's a reason for concern. Um, the yellow area here is Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. The green is Rwanda. Um, the, the capital is Kigali. And uh, Burundi to the south and Uganda to the north. And we have at least one person here tonight from Rwanda and one gentleman from, from Uganda. And... Uh, 
And again, I only spent uh, a short time, so I don't know a lot about, uh, about the region. These red dots, by the way, indicate refugee camps that were in existence two years after the event. And most of the refugee camps in this area have been, uh, they, they were replaced, they, they uh, were, were resettled, particularly down to the south, down towards Burundi. The key town that we're going to focus on is Goma, G-O-M-A. Goma sits right on the border between Rwanda and, I'll keep calling it Zaire. Uh, Giseni is a small town on the, on the Rwandan side. Um, many of you probably saw the movie uh, about Diane Fossey called uh, Gorillas in the Mist. Gorillas in the Mist took place in the Barunga Mountains, which are right here, right on the border. Um, they're prehistoric, inactive volcanoes, but, um, um, and, and that plays a part in this story as well. A little bit of background on the politics. Um, the, the events that we're talking about didn't begin in 1994. Um, they played out from a series of events that occurred in 94, but, but um, the history of, of, of the ethnic conflict there probably goes back um, to, the, to the World War I period when um, the Germans and the Belgians were controlling and, and uh, uh, managing this part of Africa. And, uh, um, there, was a, there was a move to identify people based on some aspect of, uh, referred to as ethnicity. And um, there are two tribes or two groups that were identified, Tutsis and Hutus. And uh, once again, I'm going to apologize beforehand if I get any of this incorrect, because this is, this is based on my reading and my observations and, and my time there. But in April of 94, there was a plane crash that killed the presidents of Burundi and Rwanda. And um, there was some uh, dispute about whether this was a, a, an accident or whether a rocket actually brought the aircraft down. I think um, most, most reading of history today says that a rocket brought it down. And the ethnic majority in the country, the Hutus, um, initiated an attack on the Tutsis, the, the minority. And, um, and it, once again, the way I think of the Hutus and the Tutsis is the Hutus are basically more wedded to the earth, more wedded to agricultural practices, whereas the Tutsis um, had more mobile wealth and they had more mobility in the country. And uh, between April and June, the Hutu forces um, um, were involved in the, in the killing of about a half million or greater Tutsi citizens. Late June, July, the Tutsi-led Rwandan Patriotic Front, or the RPF, uh, gained a military advantage, and uh, there, was, there were reprisals against the Hutu majority. And this is what was related to the mass exodus of Hutus who fled out of um, Rwanda, and as I said, about 800,000 um, over into uh, eastern Zaire. Rwanda has about 8 million citizens, Ethnically, about 85% Hutus, 15% Tutsis. And in terms of refugees, um, you can see the, the numbers that went to southwest Rwanda down into Burundi and also into the Goma area. The number of 800,000 is, is one that uh, uh, we use commonly, and, um, but the numbers as high as a million and a quarter have, are also reported. Talk a little bit about the volcanic hazards. And, and once again, as a geologist going into this area, um, you have to remember you're talking to people who are not geologists. And we as volcano scientists, um, when we look at this part of the world um, in eastern Zaire, we recognize four main categories of volcanic hazards. Uh, these are hazards produced by volcanic ash. When, volcanic, when, a, when a volcano erupts explosively, it sends ash high up into the atmosphere. And um, if an aircraft is flying in that airspace, uh, the ash can contaminate engines and cause engine failure. And in 1991, there was a British Airways jet going from Johannesburg, South Africa to London, flew over one of the volcanoes, ingested ash, and lost power to two of its engines. So volcanic ash, was, volcanic ash was the key issue that led the U.S. Air Force to call 
call the USGS up and say, look, what's going on? We've got aircraft going in and out of Goma Airport, and is volcanic ash going to be a problem? And that's the real reason that I went over. I, I spent about uh, six years of my career before getting into management working on volcanic ash and aviation safety. And um, so that's why I was contacted. Uh, a second type of hazard is related to the lava flows. And um, I'll show you some photographs from an eruption in 1977. I wasn't there in 77. But there was a, an eruption from one of the volcanoes that produced a very fluid lava flow. It was almost like uh, hot chocolate spilling out of the crater. And it moved at great speed, about 60 miles, about 100 kilometers per hour, down a fairly steep slope, and made it just to the outskirts of the town of Goma. And uh, that lava flow claimed more than 500 lives. It's the most deadly lava flow that we know about. Usually, Scientists, geologists like Sue and I, when we see a lava flow, we want to walk up to it and watch it carefully and observe it and uh, watch how it's moving and look at the morphology and the rheology of the flow as it moves down slope because they move generally very slowly. And you can walk on lava flows. You can go over to Etna or you can go to Hawaii and you can actually, if you want to be macho about it, you can go up and you know stick your rock hammer in it and pull some lava out. And so generally lava flows are friendly, but uh, this volcano, one of the two volcanoes we're going to talk about, was notorious for fast-moving lava flows. Volcanic earthquakes, typically when lava moves under the ground as it makes its way to the surface, it only, it only gets to the surface because it's able to break the rock and make a passageway to the surface. And as it breaks the rock, it produces earthquakes. And volcanic earthquakes can be strong at times. And there's a type of volcanic earthquake activity that we call tremor where the ground is continuously vibrating. And while it often won't cause uh, injury, it can bring buildings down, and it can cause great alarm in the population if you're sitting there an hour after hour, you've got this volcanic tremor. And then a feature that's uh, fairly rare in the world's 500 or so active volcanoes, and that's very common here in, the, in this part of Africa, is the accumulation of carbon dioxide gas in depressions. And it's so common that the Swahili language has a word for it called mazuku. And we'll talk about mazukus, because they're, they're a real concern here um, when, you, when you see the kind of situation where people are living. A little bit about the volcano profiles. We've got two volcanoes we're going to talk about. Uh, one is called Naimuragira. Naimuragira, it's a little over 10,000 feet, 30 kilometers north of Goma. This is the one that produced uh, ash that brought down, almost brought down the British Airways 747. It produces lava flows that we call a'a. A'a flows, for those of you who have been to Hawaii or taken Geology 100, uh, know that these flows move very slowly. And they're wonderful to study. You can get right up next to them as they're moving. Naimura Gear resumed activity in early July of 94. The other volcano, and this is really the one that's the bad actor, is Niragongo. Niragongo's a little bit higher, 11,000 feet. It's known for producing very, very fluid lava flows. You notice it's only 18 kilometers, or only about uh, 11, 12 miles north of Goma. It's very close. It's the dominant topographic feature you see when you look out on the Goma landscape. Um, the other feature about it is that it has a consistent and persistent lake of lava, a permanent lake of lava in the crater. It's quite spectacular, quite beautiful. And Niragongo resumed activity in late June of 94. Now, it's not unusual for both these volcanoes to be active at the same time. Uh, chemically, they have very similar lavas, but morphologically, they produce very different kinds of activity. Naimuragira has the ash, the a'a flows, Niragongo, very fluid lavas, and an active lava lake. And these two volcanoes don't look anything alike. Naimuragira is a shield volcano, a shield volcano like you see in Hawaii at Kilauea or Mauna Loa. And uh, it's fairly flat, very, very gentle, broad slopes. The summit crater is a large caldera like you see in Hawaii, very, very uh, the aspect ratio, it's, it's not very deep compared to its diameter. Whereas near Gongo, if you ask a four-year-old to draw a volcano, that four-year-old intuitively will draw near Gongo. 
it's, it's, it's probably, it's the most, it's the steepest volcano I've ever been on. And uh, you'll see in a minute. This is a Landsat satellite image of uh, some of the features we've been talking about. Here's Lake Kivu, 1,400, 1,450 meters altitude. Here's the town of Goma. Here is Niragongo volcano. Here's Naimuragira. You can see the caldera at Naimuragira. You can see into the lava lake at Niragongo. And this straight line here is the airport at Goma. It's basically a north-south oriented runway. One reason the Air Force was so concerned was there's only one way to land in uh, coming into Goma, and that's to come in over Lake Kivu. It's very dangerous to come in here because this is a broad uplands. This area here is the Virunga volcanic belt. These are where the gorillas of Diane Fossey's Gorillas in the Mist uh, live. And uh, the dividing line is Rwanda and Zaire. The, the volcano scientist response, of course, lots of people responded to this humanitarian crisis. Um, again, more than a million refugees into the Goma area. Camps were established on the slopes of two active volcanoes. People literally flooded in. Most people had what they were carrying or what they were wearing and, uh, and little more. And uh, as soon as they got to a place where they were no longer threatened by machete or, or, or gunfire, then in other words, getting out of Rwanda, they basically plopped down wherever they were. And that was generally on, the, on a lava field. Okay, as I said, we joined a group of scientists to assess the hazards in August and we produced an assessment for the High Commissioner for Refugees. This is a little bit of the story. Um, I live in Colorado, and at the time I was doing field work in southwest Colorado. Um, in late July, I kind of had a sense of what was going on over in Zaire, and I wrote a, I wrote a memo to the Air Force uh, alerting them to the fact that these two volcanoes, one of them was capable of producing volcanic ash, and that they ought to be very careful as they flew their C-130s uh, and C-5As, which is a jet-powered uh, large transport aircraft, in and out of Goma Airport. And uh, I didn't hear anything back, so I took off and went to the field. I was down in the Silverton area in, in southwest Colorado doing field work, and I called back into the office, and they said, you know, the State Department needs to get a hold of you. Please call this number. And it was Secretary Tim Wirth. Tim Wirth used to be a senator in Colorado. And in the Clinton administration, he became an undersecretary of state for humanitarian assistance. And he had run across this memo. And he said, you know, I think you, we need to get you over there. And he said, how soon can you go? And I said, well, I'll drive back to Denver. And this was a Thursday. And he said, I'd be ready by Monday. And he said, no, no, no. We're thinking of sending a, a plane down to Montrose Airport. We're going to pick you up, and we're going to fly you. I said, no, 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 I don't think you need to do something that precipitous. I said, besides, all my field gear is in Denver, and I've got to make arrangements with people. And, and so we left on a Monday. We flew from uh, Denver. We flew into Dulles Airport. And we got to Dulles Airport, and we were met there by some people from the CIA. And they brought us into this room, and they said, now we're going to show you some satellite images, and we're going to show you some secret stuff that you can't talk about, because I didn't have a security clearance at the time. And so, you know, this was, this was really getting kind of high tech and kind of, the, the, I could see the politics were mounting here. So they, 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 then they put us on a plane. It was, at that time, Sabina Airlines was still flying. It's gone now, but Sabina was the Belgian national airline. We flew into Brussels. We got in about 6 a.m. We were met by some people from the Museum of the Congo. Remember that up until 1960, um, the Congo was, was managed by, by Belgians. It was called the Belgian Congo. And virtually all of the geological information about these volcanoes was, um, was storehoused there in uh, Brussels. So they took us out to the Museum of the Congo and they rolled out maps. And, and by now, it's, you know, the, I haven't slept for almost 30 hours. I'm, I'm getting a little bit tired. And, and, uh, so we spent the day at the Museum of the Congo, and uh, then that evening, we took another Sabina flight down to Nairobi, flew into Nairobi, and then we were picked up there by a C-130, and this gentleman will recognize Entebbe Airport. Those of you who have ever seen the famous, uh, the Israeli attack to rescue, this is Entebbe, and there's still, this is the control tower at Entebbe. This is what we were using for the staging area for the, 
for uh, getting relief supplies into uh, Goma. And we landed, and this C-130 is the aircraft that took us down to Goma. Uh, we arrived in Goma. Uh, the area was basically a military zone. Uh, the U.S. had responsibility for the airlift, and um, there were uh, qu quite a large French contingent of soldiers there as well. And uh, when, we, when we got there, uh, this young lady from the U.S. Embassy in Kinshasa met us. Uh, this gentleman from USAID met us. And this military guy who was going to be our, basically our bodyguard was with us. This is a scientist from the Hawaiian Observatory called Jack Lockwood. Jack's an expert in uh, Hawaiian type lava flows. And we were basically, we had just landed and we were getting a briefing at the Goma Airport. Um, these volcanoes, both volcanoes have been persistently active throughout the 20th century. They're active in the 21st century. Big eruptions in 2002. Another eruption uh, just last year in 2005. Once again, in your mind's eye, remember the satellite image, Lake Kivu, city of Goma, the Goma Airport, Niragongo volcano, Naimuragira volcano. These gray areas or black areas show lava flows in the last 30 years between uh, about 1971 and, and 1992. And the feature that you see, you notice that there's a lot of, a lot of barren, well, I can tell you that they're barren, but they're, 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 they're big, broad lava flow areas, and this is where the refugee camps were being established. I mentioned that in 1977, there was an eruption that produced a very fluid lava flow, and it went basically down through a series of villages here on the south flank of Niragongo, uh, right to the entrance of the city of Goma. Uh, this is a geological map. Uh, those of you not geologists, when we go out to the field and produce geologic maps, we generally, we like to color the maps. I, I think we're all, those of us are, who do geologic mapping, we're like, you know, frustrated kids who never got it quite right when we were coloring our coloring books. But uh, the, the colors here refer to the origin of the lavas. All the red lavas that you see, the red, pink, shaded lavas are coming from Naimuragira volcano. You can see quite an extensive shield of the Hawaiian type. The blue lavas here refer to lavas from Niragongo. Here's the crater. And you can see that if you go into Goma town, and you see lavas right there in town, those are prehistoric lavas that have come from Niragongo volcano. And then the green lavas over here are the lavas of Virunga volcanic belt. Um, they're prehistoric, no known historic activity. And the historic record in this area, both from um, the European occupation and then the oral tradition, is only about 300 years old. And then these uh, yellowish patches that you see are uh, small explosion craters. And there's one important one right here in the town of Goma. And again, these are prehistoric. They're, they're, they're older than 300 years. So the, the dividing line between um, Zaire or Congo to your left and Rwanda is basically right in here. Almost, almost forms the border or the valley between Niragongo lavas and Virunga lavas. These uh, large green points that you can see here and here, uh, these are clusters of some of the camps that will, the refugee camps that we'll talk about. A little bit about uh, Niragongo volcano. This is sort of a, a perspective view. Uh, once again, here's Lake Kivu, here's the crater, here's the airport. And the area of concern um, were lava flows that might come down towards the airport and also into Goma Village. Um, there's a couple key crater names, Baruta Crater, we don't need to remember these, and Shaheru Crater here on the lower slopes. And um, it's these, uh, the Shaheru Crater, that produced the hyperfluid or very fluid lavas in January of 1977. Here's an aerial view of Goma. Uh, as we're circling around, we, we've, we've flown from Entebbe over to Kigali, over in Rwanda, and now over to Goma. And uh, remember I said there was a young volcanic cone. This is the young Mount Goma cone. Here's the city of Goma. At the time, it had a population of about 25,000. That population ballooned to about 400,000 during the refugee crisis. What you can see in the, in the distance here is Giseni and then the Virunga volcanics, and you're looking into Rwanda here. And uh, you can see a lot of uh, shanty-type uh, houses that have 
that have uh, come in. And this was taken in early August, and one of the things that struck me <coughs> looking at older photographs of Goma was, was, were all the trees, almost a forest in the town. It was a very beautiful town. It was one of the key resort towns. Again, you're in Africa. You're at a fairly high altitude, so the, the climate is cool. It's very refreshing. And when the refugees came in, in their search for firewood, basically they cut down um, most of the trees in Goma. In Goma today, in, in photographs from 2005, you, you almost don't see a tree in Goma. Uh, this is a perspective at the airport. And again, there's, there's the volcano that your, that your five-year-old child has drawn. Very, very steep-sided, 11,400 feet high. And um, we, we basically landed there on this long flight from Denver to Dulles to Brussels to Nairobi to Entebbe to, till we got here. And I was pretty exhausted. I went to bed that night in a, in a hotel there in Goma. And during the night, we, you could hear the, the windows rattling from the, from the constant earthquakes. And uh, I looked out the window, and I could see uh, a red glow. And I didn't, I didn't know where the volcano was, because uh, when we got there, I knew, I knew it was to the north of town, but I hadn't seen it in profile yet. And at night, I woke up, and I could see the, the red glow above the crater lake the lava lake. Um, what we did the next morning, actually we got in that helicopter that was in the previous picture. It was a French helicopter and we went up to, to inspect both volcanoes. We went first over to Naimuragira. We could see that there were very slow lava flows moving into the jungle. And because it was jungle over there, very few of the refugees had gone over to Naimuragira. There were refugees on the north side of Naimuragira, but the lava flow activity was on the south side. So our initial assessment at Naimuragira volcano was it's, it doesn't present a present hazard to the, to the refugees. It was active and it was producing small ash eruptions, and so it was a hazard potentially to the aviation. And we, pretty much the Air Force folks knew that they had to stay away from Naimuragira. We then went over to the summit area of Niragongo, and we landed up on the summit. And we basically decided what we were, we could see there was a lava lake in the crater. And of course, this is a nighttime shot. What we did was to land on the rim, and we had tents, we had all of our equipment with us. And we basically spent the night up on the rim. And this was the kind of activity, low-level lava fountaining, uh, pahoyhoy, another Hawaiian term for very fluid lavas. Uh, but basically, we could see down, and the crater was about, uh, it was about 400 meters deep. And, and when we knew from the 1977 eruption at to what altitude the level of the crater lake had gotten. So we, we saw that the container that was the interior crater of Niragongo was not full. And so another hazard that we were concerned about, breach of the crater and uh, failure of the crater uh, walls um, to produce leakage of the lava lake, we realized, well, that's probably not a very realistic thing. So again, that's a low probability hazard. We basically spent the night there. This is flying up in the helicopter. Uh, we basically landed at this point here and we're able to look in. And then the next day we walked down. There's a, there's a trail that uh, tourists, this, is a, this, this used to be a very visited area by tourists. You'd go over to see the gorillas in Virunga, then you'd cross over into Congo. You'd climb near Agongo, you'd see the lava lake. You know, you had the whole experience of, of the Virunga volcanic area. Quite spectacular. Uh, the vegetation, it looks pretty green, but, but the, it's just shrubbery and grasses. It's, uh, it's pretty denuded. When you're up in the crater, um, this, this, is, this, is the, this photograph is from a Frenchman, a friend who was there in the late 70s, before the 77 eruption. And uh, you can see, this is from the same perspective that I showed you the other one, but you can see that the lava lake level was much higher. Um, once again, we're looking at Niragongo volcano, Goma's down here, and the breach, we're gonna talk a little bit about the 77 eruption because it was on everyone's mind, because right now, or in 94 and 95, there were several hundred thousand refugees that had flooded into this area. And some of them were camped on the 77 lava flow surface. And we were very concerned that um, uh, if the crater lake filled up anymore, we could have a breach in the Shiheru crater area here, and it could cause catastrophic deaths. Um, I mentioned the summit of uh, Naimuragira. 
This is the caldera. Those of you who have been to Hawaii, uh, you, you, you get the analogy or the similarity to Kilauea volcano. This would be the Halemaumau pit crater. Um, this is the crater of the activity that was going on in 94. And once again, it's not presenting a significant threat. There were no refugees up in Naimuragira crater. Um, this is a small uh, vent on the flank. And this is the active lava flows uh, from the 94 activity sort of invading out into the, into the dense jungle. As we, would, as we flew over here, believe it or not, we would see cattle. We would see a cow here, and we would see a person tending a cow in the jungle. And I mean, they knew that lava flow was coming. That, that person was probably not a refugee. They were probably an inhabitant in that area. But uh, anyway, Naimura gear, at least on the south side, not a significant thing. So the issue from volcanic ash, the, the small explosions from Naimura gear uh, were, were low level, probably didn't present a significant threat to aviation, but it was easy to keep the aircraft from flying over there. Fast moving lava flows like the 77 flow, uh, because we didn't see the, the crater filled with lava, we felt pretty confident in saying it didn't look like we were about to have a breach of the crater. So we didn't think that fast moving lava flows were gonna be a particular problem. Volcanic earthquakes, we were feeling all the time. Uh, I think and compared to the horrors that many of the refugees had experienced, the, the low level tremor for the volcanic earthquakes wasn't, wasn't particularly threatening to them. The carbon dioxide of the Mazukus was something that uh, we'll, we'll touch on shortly. Talk a little bit about the 77 eruption, drain the crater lake, produced a very fluid, almost like a, like a hot chocolate kind of uh, lava flow. Moved at speeds in excess of 60 miles an hour to the south right towards Goma, got right to the edge of the airport, completely inundated several villages. And because it happened so suddenly, it had had quite a few fatalities, more than 500. And as I say, the most deadly lava flow that we know about. Um, again, near Agongo, and this is the area we're gonna go. We're gonna see some villages in this area just now. This was the eruption in January of 77, as seen from the Virunga side over in Rwanda. And you can see, geologists would look at this, and you can see the eruption column here. And you see these little toes or little fingers coming out at the base. We call these pyroclastic flows. These are, these are hot envelopes of gas and ash that are, that are coming down slope at a, at a pretty high rate of speed. And if people were up there, they would be enveloped in these and they would be killed. The famous eruption in uh, the Caribbean at, at, at Saint-Pierre in 1902 was produced from, a, from these kinds of pyroclastic flows. Anyway, some villagers, uh, probably some volcanologists there, local volcanologists watching the eruption. Um, this is a small village, and uh, it's difficult to see. This is pottery scattered on the ground, but the lava flow basically moved right through this village, and uh, there's some banana trees there that got coated. Um, here's some banana plants and some other uh, small vegetation. As, this, as the lava came around a corner, it splashed up, and uh, usually lavas don't behave that way. Lavas generally move fairly slowly. But this lava, again, it was very fluid, moved very quickly. And this was our worst fear. All of us were very concerned about this until we had made that trip to the summit crater. Um, we'll talk a little bit now about the Mazukus. Mazuku is a Swahili word, meaning, and, and again, if somebody speaks Swahili, they can correct me, but we were told valley or depression of death. Uh, not exactly sure why, but in the local history, uh, people knew that if they wandered into certain depressions on still days, there would be an absence of uh, breathable air and they would uh, fall over. Uh, Mazukus are not uh, unique just to Zaire. Uh, we have them in Chile. We have them in Italy. In Italy, they're called mofetta. Mofetta, they're accumulations of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide fumaroles. They're also known in Iceland. And uh, there's stories there of Iceland uh, sheep farmers having their going out and the sheep wander into a depression and keel over. They're formed by the accumulation of carbon dioxide, which is an odorless or colorless gas. And now some of you have probably opened a bottle of beer or opened a Coca-Cola, particularly a warm Coca-Cola. And, uh, you, and you, if you smell it right away, there's a very sharp, acrid smell that you get. Well, that's carbonic acid that's exsolving. That's the carbon dioxide exsolving out of that Coke. And of course, being a geologist and being a gas geochemist, I wanted to see if it was really 
if you really couldn't smell it. Everybody said, oh, it, you can't smell it. So I had a guy hold me by the collar and he lowered my head down into the mizuku and, and sure enough, it, you can't smell it. <laughs> I, I could have read about it, but one of the problems was that adults generally stand above the pool of gas. The gas accumulates on the ground surface. And I've, I've seen stories of, uh, you know, a family one, walking along with a dog and suddenly the dog keels over. And, and you look down and you can't see anything, but you know that the, that, that the CO2 is accumulated probably up to your knee level. And the same for small children. It was particularly acute concern that we had for the small children. So after several days being on site and dealing with the ash and dealing with the lava flows, um, much of the work we did then was to go into each of the camps and uh, map the mazukus, and this became a key part of our assessment. This looks like a, 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 you know, it was typical countryside on the south flank of Niragongo. And what you see here is a depression, and there's no large vegetation in there because the carbonic acid also um, does something to the roots of plants, and plants don't seem to grow very vigorously there. But uh, this is my colleague Jack Lockwood and three of my Zairean colleagues, and we're, we're wandering around in the Mazuku. Probably not the greatest thing to be doing, but. Um, you know, we were trying to understand where the CO2 comes from. We were looking for evidence of, of, uh, of dead creatures, small birds, um, small animals, uh, that, and, and God forbid any humans. We never saw any humans, but we did see a lot of small animal carcasses. And uh, this is one of our colleagues, and typically what we did, we had a torch, and it was just a, a stick with some cloth dipped in kerosene, and it was a flame. And uh, we would hold this in front of us as we were walking over the surface. And here's my colleague lowering this down. And notice the flame now, and he lowers it about six inches, and it expires. There's no more oxygen. And uh, it's snuffed out. And so obviously that's a place that you wouldn't want a small child wandering into. You wouldn't want an animal wandering into it. And the key thing is, of course, the animals go in, and then the little children follow the animals as they go to try to get them out. So we went to a number of the camps to map the mazukus, as well as the, the whole issue of the um, lava flows and, and whether, and lava flows typically tend to follow depressions in the land surface. And so if people are building their, um, putting up their structures in a small valley, they've got a problem because a lava flow could eventually come in there, but more importantly, they have the mazuku or the carbon dioxide problem. There was a small volcano observatory in Goma. It's called the Goma Volcano Observatory. It still exists. It had uh, staffed mainly by Zairean scientists. It was supported by the government of Japan. And uh, a Japanese scientist has been uh, uh, working with them for, for over a decade now. Focuses on visual observations, meaning that once a month they climb up to the, to the summit crater of Niragongo and they measure the depth of the lava lake which we can, do, and that's what the guys at the CIA were showing me at Dulles Airport, by the way. They were, they had these, they weren't Tom Clancy quality uh, spy kind of photos, but they, they gave you an idea of where the surface of the lava lake was. But they also were doing seismic studies, trying to understand the depth of the earthquake, the locations of the earthquakes, and they managed a small seismic network at both Niragongo and Naimoragira. This is the Goma Volcano Observatory. Remember as we flew into Goma, I showed you that cinder cone Cinder cone's a high point, so there's a lot of television, or, or uh, sorry, radio antennas up on the slopes of Mount Goma, and this is the Goma Volcano Observatory. This is a portable seismometer that we deployed uh, at, a, at a caretaker building up on the slopes of uh, Niragongo, and we would have to go in each day and recover. This, is, this drum and, and these scratchings on the drum are uh, recording of earthquakes and we would go in every 24 hours and recover this paper, put in a new piece of paper, take that paper back to the Goma Observatory and count the number of earthquakes that we had. So again, the volcano scientist response, uh, we've, t we've uh, talked about the teams we had, the role particularly of the Japanese and the Zaireans. The French have had, uh, um, uh, French expatriates really enjoyed living in the Goma area. As I said, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, area and before the, the 94 crisis, it was a major tourist site in that part of Africa, and uh, many of those were French. There was recently uh, a NOVA special 
uh, called, I think it's called The City Under the Volcano. And uh, if you watch that, it focuses on the work that we did, particularly the work of the French scientists going into the crater. Jacques Durio is our French colleague who was very involved in that. And as I said, we produced the hazard assessment for UNHCR. This is a typical Virungan village. This is, this is a village unaffected by either volcanic activity, although the soil here is all volcanic ash from near Agongo. And, uh, you know, it, it might look poor, but it's actually a fairly prosperous area. And I think it's, uh, it, it, it's a mistake to try to compare our meaning of poor in the United States with uh, the situation over there. But uh, these folks seem to have plenty of food. We stopped in the village. The people seemed healthy. They seemed happy. And their big concern was they didn't want the refugees flooding up there. Um, there's a language difference. Uh, of course, in the Congo, it's a famous, it's, it's, it's French-based, French language versus Rwanda, which is English. And uh, so the, the one common language was Swahili that, that um, uh, people could speak and communicate. But this is a typical, we call it Virunga village. Some of the refugee camps, these are the camps that had more than 200,000 refugees. And the four that we worked in, mainly Mugungu, uh, which is right by Lake Kivu. And uh, at our time there, I observed that a lot of, the, a lot of Rwandan uh, military, still in their military garb, typically carrying a gunny sack. And you know in that gunny sack they had a Kalashnikov, which is an automatic uh, machine gun. Um, typically they would be drinking warm beer. Typically they would be drunk. Typically they were very aggressive towards any of us who came into the camp. And so we tried to avoid those people. Um, Kibumba camp, key thing there was it's in the saddle between Barunga volcano and Niragunga volcano. It's over 7,000 feet in elevation. And uh, a lot of these folks, a lot of these people that escaped, small children, they're literally wearing underpants, a t-shirt, and that's it. And uh, usually every afternoon it would start to rain and it would soak everything. And by about uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if you were in the camps, you could hear people, their teeth chattering you could, from the hypothermia. There wasn't much food and there was very little water. And uh, it was, it was a, a very difficult situation. Katali Camp was built up on the north, northern side of near uh, Naimuragira. It was built on the 1981 uh, lava flow. Probably a safe place to be because there was a valley on both sides now. The 81 flow filled in a valley. People camped on the, on the top of the lava flow, also safe from the Mazukus. And the Moningi flow was partially on the 77 lava flow just to the north of the airport. And then there were many uh, smaller camps. I showed you this at the start. This was the situation about two years after the main refugee crisis. And you can see that most of the camps that we've talked about on the volcanoes have been moved down to Burundi and, and out, of the, out of the volcanoes harm's way. Just uh, some snapshots now. This is up at the Kibumba camp, up at 7,000 feet. Um, there used to be a eucalyptus uh, forest up here, or a tree like a eucalyptus. I'm not sure it was really eucalyptus. And you saw a lot of stumps. Um, each individual small shelter would have a small fire in front of it. If people had a pot, they would be trying to cook something to, to eat. Um, generally, the people in the camps were, were very kind towards us, particularly the children. It was just the, the camp down at Lake Kivu where there were so many of the, of the Rwandan military that were aggressive. Um, you, don't, you didn't see many of the trees left. Um, this is before the camps had centralized uh, sanitary facilities. Uh, a lot of the NGOs like Oxfam and Save the Children, um, one of the key things, one of the first things they did was to come in and try to centralize uh, the, the sanitary aspects because people were relieving themselves anywhere you went in the camp. And it made it interesting walking around looking for the depressions. We, we would go into these camps looking for depressions in the volcanic lava flows and we had tape that we would flag off and say, no people should be putting their homes in this area. No people should be going into this lava tube. Lava tubes are, are tunnels that form as a lava flow moves through. The roof of the lava flow solidifies, and as the center drains away, it makes a very convenient, very, very nice place. And in some places in the world, people live in the lava tubes. Our concern here was that carbon dioxide gas would accumulate in there. Of course, you're cold, you're, you're, you're really discomforted, 
and uh, you're wet, and a lot of people were going down into the lava tubes, and we had to flag those off and say, you know, this is a keep out area. And again, Kibumba refugee camp, just some of the, some of the, uh, while we were there, people were coming in, the NGOs were coming in and, and installing the latrines, also installing the water, uh, sanitary water supplies. Basically, the water was coming from Lake Kivu. Uh, people like the Kentucky National Guard were setting up these large um, water purification plants. They would take the water out of Lake Kivu and treat it uh, using a reverse osmosis process. And then they would truck that water up to the camps and they would have organized distribution of the water. This is the Menungu camp. This is the one I really didn't like. This was right down on the, on the slopes. And you can see this fellow here still wearing his military garb. He's probably got a bottle of beer in that hand. This, this, was, the, this was the most uncomfortable of the camps. It was the, it was the large camp closest to the city of Goma. And this is the one that had the greatest gas accumulation hazard, the greatest Mizuku hazard. And so we ended up going back there pretty frequently. And it was, uh, it was uh, the policy uh, was that you did not stay out. None of the, none of the assistants uh, people were, were, were able to stay out at night. They wanted us all back in town by dark. Some bad things continued to happen. And again, Mugungu refugee camp. Children were, I call them a special case. Um, there were more than 70,000 children, largely Hutu, who were separated from their families as they migrated out of Rwanda. They were particularly vulnerable to the Mizuku hazard because they're small. These are little kids. The High Commissioner for Refugees established special children's camps. And I've, I've seen these now in other, other hazards. Uh, the Indian Ocean earth, uh, tsunami and the Sumatran earthquake. Uh, we saw uh, children's camps as well. The, the, the really good news here is that they've, they've got very successful methods for reuniting these children with their families, and very few of these children become orphaned. The, the Sumatran case we'll talk about tomorrow is unique because a lot of the adults were killed. A lot of the children were up in villages away from the inundation zone from the tsunami. And so Sumatra is really quite, it's quite a challenging place now because of all the, the orphaned children. Um, these are children in one of the camps. Um, they separated the children from the adults because there was, there was fear or concern about abuse of the children by the adults. And uh, the camps were very orderly. They had latrines, they had clean water, and um, they, the, the bookkeeping was generally excellent. Each child had, was identified in some way. They knew the name, they, they, they had a, a list of uh, relatives' names that the child remembered. And uh, I could see why they would think that they, that they were successful in getting reunited. And again, generally, these children were, were well kept. I didn't, the hypothermia issue, you can see the kinds of clothing the kids are wearing. But you know, you wander into these camps and you're just mobbed by these kids and they're, they're incredibly, incredibly innocent and incredibly kind. And uh, they just love seeing a white guy with a beard, you know, as you wandered in there. They hadn't seen much of that in their life. This is my colleague, Jack Lockwood. Again, another uh, camp with the children. Um, there were people dying all the time. There were about 4,000 uh, deaths per day in the camps. And um, removing the corpses was a real problem. Typically, when an individual died, they would be rolled up in a grass mat. And these are corpses here waiting to be picked up. And um, Relief efforts, uh, the U.S. was probably the leader in terms, of, uh, in terms of both financial and military support to the relief operation. Um, more than a quarter, probably closer to a half billion dollars was committed by the U.S. A lot of it was managed by USAID and the State Department and the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance and the Department of Defense. We had over 2,000 troops in the theater uh, involved in everything like the Kentucky National Guard, uh, responsible for water purification. Um, a lot of the aircraft going in, again, were, were National Guards from places like Texas, New York State, et cetera. Uh, the non-governmental organizations also played a very prominent role. And as the U.S. pulled out, uh, particularly the French, British, Japanese, and then later, I think a lot of the, 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 the relief efforts were managed by the Ghanaian troops. Um, 
by 96, you saw that most of these refugee camps had been resettled. People had either gone back to Rwanda or had moved down to Burundi. Um, but the volcanoes continue to be a problem. The 94 eruption ended pretty much by, by uh, early September. Um, there, there, there was no loss of life because of lava flows or volcanic ash. Um, in 2002, there was a, a famous eruption that, that caught CNN's attention. They must have had a film crew with not a lot to do and they, they sort of flooded the zone and they really, they gave it saturation coverage. And I don't think there were really any fatalities. There were some casualties, there were some injuries. But this is one of these lava flows and you recognize by the morphology of Pahoyhoy flow that's literally invaded into Goma uh, city and uh, caused, caused some significant damage in town. But it was, uh, it, was, it was a single event. It flooded part of the airport. Um, this is Goma and you can see the red here indicates the areas of the lava flows. Here's the airport and you can see about a half of the runway, third of the runway was covered by lava. Lake Kibu again down here. And, but it was a single event. The flow was fluid, but it wasn't hyperfluid like the 77 flow. And once again, people were able to walk out of harm's way. And uh, they, they very quickly opened the uh, runway up again. And then this is a photograph taken in December of, of 2005, just a few months ago. And you can see the steam coming from the summit of Niragongo. So once again, in the disaster cycle, we kind of stepped in in the, in the, in the response stage. Um, when we left, we had worked with the scientists from the Goma Volcano Observatory to uh, help them deal with the preparedness aspect, get better monitoring out, get better seismic monitoring out. Um, and also the, the, the publication or the communication of the geologic hazard information so that when, so that people in Goma, when a lava flow came in, they knew where to go. They knew to go to higher ground. And uh, um, so that's, it, it, it's not a nice, neat cycle, but uh, it, it, for every event, you're going to step into one of these um, aspects. And if you read the, the piece that Sue was describing about mega disasters, uh, you know, people often ask me, are we having more volcanic eruptions? Are we having more earthquakes? Are we having more, you know, tsunamis or wildland fires? Wildland fires we won't touch right now. But for these other events, no. I don't think geologically we can say that we're having more of these events. But what is happening that we're becoming more vulnerable because societal trends are placing more property and people in harm's way. And uh, when you have a unique situation like the Rwandan refugee crisis where you put a million people into the areas around two active volcanoes, uh, you've got the potential for um, a, a very serious um, disaster that could take place. So that's, uh, that's my message tonight. Thank you all so much for listening. And I'd be happy to chat with you or answer any questions or, or hear any comments that some of you, if you've had some experience over there, would like to share. Thank you. ask if it's possible if you have comments would you step to the microphone um, because this is being video streamed and recorded and that would that would help us um, was there a question or a comment um, I actually had one that's sure a little bit just experience but I know that if you're in the US Geological Survey you don't easily send a memo to the Air Force that a volcano may erupt and have ash how long did it how did that have to go through the system in well, both sides yeah, after, I, I had been working for about a decade on the issue of, of volcanic hazards to aviation safety. And I worked mostly with commercial aviation. And I knew a lot of the folks in the Federal Aviation Administration, folks in the National Weather Service. But we also were doing a lot of work with uh, people in the Air Force, because the Air Force has a lot of aircraft that are in flight every day all around the world. And we're flying in and out of air bases in the Caribbean, air bases in Italy, and these are air bases and air bases in Japan. These are air bases that operate fairly close to active volcanoes. And so they had a, 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 a lot of interest. And the memo I sent went to Offutt Field outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, which is where the, where the Air Force's World Weather Command is. And that's where they issue their advisories on volcanic ash 
to Air Force pilots. And I knew some people at, at Offutt, and I simply sent them uh, an email uh, pointing out that these two volcanoes were active. We knew we had people flying in and out, uh, that the U.S. Uh, Air Force was responsible for the lift going in. And I pointed out that in 1991, there had been a, a, a small eruption at Naimuragira that had almost brought down a 747. And, um, and I gave them some advice. I said, you know, fly upwind. You guys have, they, I knew they had a meteorology station in, in uh, in Entebbe uh, for the operations in that theater. And I said, you know, basically you can avoid volcanic ash and don't try to fly through it. And um, so that was, that was my message. It was pretty, pretty simple. And I wasn't really expecting, uh, I wasn't expecting to ask, be asked to go over. I was just telling them that, you know, this is what you can do to avoid any problem. Any other comments? Yes. Right. Um, one, one of the things that we found, first of all, a lot of the refugees are gone. They've gone back to Rwanda or they've left the area. One of the things we learned was that the locals had remarkable local knowledge and memory of events. So in many ways, they didn't need a geologic hazard map. They knew that they, on still days, when there was, and they had a name for it, they had a, there was a wind that comes off Lake Kivu. And if that wind wasn't blowing, they knew that they didn't go into these depressions. And they referred to the depressions as mazukus. This is where, this is the other ones that hurt. So the local knowledge, they had lived with these in their own lifetime. Um, the refugees coming in from Rwanda, they, they hadn't seen anything like this. They came from generally lower altitudes. Some of them were at similar elevations, but lower altitudes. They hadn't experienced active volcanoes. And uh, they were the ones that needed the instruction and the, the information. And again, the language gap between a dominant Francophile versus Anglophile language it made, it, made a communication problem. It was, it was, it was very interesting to watch. And um, the, the, the inability of the locals to communicate with the refugees. Um, I think most of the people living in Goma today, and the population of Goma today, I think is close to 200,000. It was about 25,000, but it's really exploded. It's really ballooned for a lot of reasons. Um, they, they just had a democratic election in Congo. Um, they had a lot of instability in the eastern part of the country. Um, but I gather that in relation to other parts of the country, the Goma area was a relatively safe haven. So a lot of people flooded in there. There was good agricultural prospects. There's water from the lake. And uh, so I think that there has been a process of trying to educate the local Goma population to the problems or to the hazards of the volcano. But at the time, when we were there in 94, the locals weren't really the ones who, who really needed the information as much as the refugees. And the camp managers, the NGOs that were trying to manage where the refugee camps were put. Well, we, you know, we talked about moving the airport. We, the, there's really no place to move the airport to. You can go on the southwest side of Naimuragira, and there's some farmland there, and an airport could be put in there. They, they, they could move it. But um, I, it's, it's a very, very poor country, and I just, I've never heard talk about trying to move the airport. I think they're going to manage and live with the with the uncertainty of the, of the volcano. And what they've done is to upgrade the monitoring, so they monitor earthquakes. And, uh, and typically in both of these volcanoes, there's a good correlation between increase in earthquake activity and eventual eruption. And um, uh, based mainly on the work that the Japanese scientists have been doing now for, it's, it's, it's over 20 years of, of record that they have. Yeah. 
We have time for one short question. Yeah, I have to say, yeah. Tom has started his day at 3 o'clock Denver yeah. time this morning, and you're well, doing very no, well. No, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm, if people want to talk about this is good stuff. Several things that you said during the course of your talk amazed me, namely the orderliness of the refugee camps. You said children were separated from the parents. That seems like a very unnatural thing. You mentioned the NGOs. I've heard about in other cases where the NGOs were competing with one another and so forth. Um, when you have a city or any kind of grouping of people, there's, need, there's always some kind of economic activity in those refugee camps. What economic activity could there be? Selling beer from the brewery in Gassani. Who has money? <laughs> um, there was money. There was, there was Zairean money. I've got, I've got a whole stack of Mobutu Sisi Seiko's picture on, on, the, on the money from Zaire. There, there was money in the camps. There would be people, and you couldn't see them, but as you walk in the camps, we would walk along and we would find a larger than usual shelter. <clears throat> and we would get up and a gentleman would come up and he'd be wearing a suit. And we'd go over to what I thought was his shelter and you'd peel the shelter back and there was his car. And he said, if I, if I am disclosed, if you, he was very concerned that we were going to tell people that he was there. I didn't know his name. I mean, and, th and this didn't happen just once. This happened, you know, half a dozen times a day. You would see individuals who felt that they were marked and that they would be um, subject to, to being killed if people found out where they were in the camps. Small shops had, had set up, particularly along the Mugungu Road, and that's where they were selling the beer. You could, you could go buy beer. There were people there selling clothing. And I don't know where they were getting the clothing from. Well, there were corpses. They were probably stripping the corpses before they, before they disposed of them. Um, and there were probably other methods of barter. I didn't, I didn't uh, look into the issue of money, but there was money. Um, you raised another point. You, the competition of NGOs. You know, I did not see it in this situation. Um, I was in Banda Aceh in North Sumatra after the earthquake and tsunami, um, over in Sri Lanka, over in south of Colombo, down by Gaul. Um, the, the NGOs, the, 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 there was a joke about it. The NGOs are tripping over themselves to, uh, you know, they bought up all the Toyota Land Cruisers in Sri Lanka, the NGOs, so there were none available for the locals. And in Sri Lanka, a point I'll make tomorrow is, they did a lot of self-rescuing there. They did, the, the, the people in the villages were very good at taking care of themselves in Sri Lanka. In Indonesia, they, they pretty much were, were of course, they had, a, they had a more traumatic event. They had a magnitude eight plus earthquake, and then they had the tsunami, and they were, I think there was a deeper traumatization, and a lot more of the adults were killed in relation to the children. Um, but, but there was a lot of competition following the tsunami and the earthquake. Um, I didn't see that in 94 in Rwanda. Um, I don't think there were as many folks involved as, as there were later. Um, you know, you, there's, 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 there's quite a few, uh, there's several movies, quite, I think, excellent movies. Hotel Rwanda is one that I, I found to be I, I wasn't really in Kigali for any, any real period of time. We landed, we took off. Um, but, this, but the sense of that movie, the sense of the desperation, um, I, I saw it in, in, in Goma, I saw it in some of the camps, particularly among the people who could communicate. You know, I speak a little bit of French, I speak English, so you know, we were hearing stories from, from both sides. And, uh, would you like to say anything? We have a young lady here from Rwanda. Uh, would you like to say anything about uh, the situation? I don't want to, I, sorry we didn't get together earlier today. We were trying to get together earlier to chat, but. I, I am pleased to, to have you here and tell us what, happening, what happened there in 94 hours and there. But um, there are so many things happened in that refugee camps, but we are happy now that the camps, people are moving, going back home or going to other 
side of country, which may be better for them. So the businesses in the refugee camps had been there, and most of the time what we, not, we have been noticing was mostly the rapes of kids and kids having kids, and some of them went back to Rwanda and kids are taking care of the kids. So, But right now people are moving on, are trying to get better life and try not to to forget, maybe take the past and move on for, for the better future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah. I want to thank Tom for what I think is a really good illustration of these interfaces between science, policy, and human behavior. And just say that he'll be on Focus 580 tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and then talking at 4 o'clock in Spurlock about the Sumatra earthquake. He's had a quite unusual life. <laughs> Thanks again, Tom. Thanks. Thank you.